Everyone, welcome back. This is uh, chapter 11 of the IT Fundamentals Plus U61 All-in-One Exam Guide presented by Total Seminars. Uh, the book is written by Scott Jernigan and Mike Myers. We are going to be covering in chapter 11 IT security threat mitigation. Now this chapter will cover local security threats as well as online security threats. In the previous version of the book, uh, these two uh, categories were separated into two different chapters. We had one chapter for local security threats and one chapter for online security threats. And these have all been combined together into one chapter. So chapter 11's objectives are that we will be able to identify threats to local PC security. We will be able to describe physical access control and device hardening. We will be able to select appropriate user account types. We will be able to define and compare types of a malicious software. We will protect against malware and social engineering and also know how to describe browser privacy and security issues. Since two chapters have been combined into one, we have a lot to cover in this chapter. And so there'll be a lot of information that will be presented to you. Feel free to go back and review this video as, ma as many times as you need in order to view the different things that are important uh, regarding the U61 IT Fundamentals Plus exam. So we will start with local security threats. Now local, remember in this for uh, computer terminology, it represents things within your computer and around your computer, but not necessarily connected to the internet. So these are things that could happen on that. Uh, the first one is dealing with unauthorized access. Now unauthorized access is defined by someone accessing resources on your computer without the permission of the owner. This isn't always bad, but it becomes malicious when the person intentionally takes advantage of weaknesses and gains information, uses resources, or destroys data. The next category is password cracking, and this is one way that someone could get unauthorized access. Password cra cracking is the disciplined technique to obtain a password through a number of different ways. One way is using trial and error. They just continue to keep guessing until they find the answer. The attacker can also use password cracking software, uh, which will be usually used personal information about that user or written down information from that user. So password cracking is where someone attempts to get into the computer using some sort of trial and error or software. Now to prevent these things, what we wanna do is we always wanna use complex passwords and never write them down. And if you do need to write them down, you don't leave them in an easy place for someone to find. You put it in a hidden location. The next type of local security threat is considered dumpster diving. Dumpster diving is where an attacker goes through a user's trash looking for information. And this is a thing. Someone can possibly go through trash and find confidential information such as passwords and usernames and uh, social security numbers and different things like that. To prevent uh, someone from dumpster diving is you want to make sure you shred sensitive information using a paper shredder. Another type of unauthorized access is shoulder surfing. Shoulder surfing is when attackers spy on you from behind watching what you type. They could look over your shoulder and see you putting in a credit card number. They could look over your shoulder and see you putting in a password or a pin code. So this is very important to make sure you're aware of your surroundings. So to prevent shoulder surfing, make sure you check your surroundings before typing personal information. You can also use these uh, privacy filters, which makes your screener, uh, excuse me, which makes your screen harder to read from various angles. Another type of unauthorized access is unauthorized Wi-Fi usage. This is where an attacker joins your network and if file and print sharing is enabled, they can access, read, and even destroy your files. To prevent this, you should make sure you implement wireless encryption methods such as WPA2 that we talked about in a previous chapter. Another type is data destruction, and data destruction is unauthorized access that modifies, deletes files, or changes system settings. Theft uh, is the act of physically stealing technology and all information or data contained within the device. You can typically um, prevent 
theft just by simply making sure that uh, you use a cable lock or that you put it in a safe locked location. I have a picture of a cable lock on the next slide that we'll look at. This is an example of a cable lock. On the side of the person's laptop, there's a place that you can hook in a lock into, and then you just run this cable around the leg of a table or something secure that can't be picked up or moved around, and then when you're ready, you can undo it by using a combination. Now, theft, again, is physical theft, where they're taking your resources or taking your device. And then the, the next kind uh, that we're going to talk about is malware. And malware is malicious software written to do something unwelcome to your computer. It can be obtained from the internet, it can be obtained from USB drives, and they can also be obtained from writable optical disks. Now we are gonna be going into the different types of malware later on during this video, but malware is another one of these un uh, local security threats. So going back over this, these are all unauthorized access, which is password cracking, dumpster diving, shoulder surfing, unauthorized Wi-Fi usage. Make sure you understand all of those unauthorized access um, categories. And then also along with that, data destruction, theft, and malware are other local threats. To talk about physical security, um, one thing that you should always make sure you talk about is access control. Access control is basically how you are controlling the access to someone has to your electronic devices. Uh, make sure if you can lock the door and or don't leave the PC unattended while logged in. Uh, you can always lock your computer screen by hitting your Windows button and your L button. And a lot of people don't know that. If you're using a Windows computer, if you, you have a Windows button uh, just down on the bottom row next kind of a couple ways across from your space bar, there's a Windows symbol. And if you hold, hold down Windows and the L, you'll be able to lock your computer, which is, allows you to be able to then password protect it so only people who know the password can get in. If you leave it Un, uh, unattended and it's not locked, people can go in and do whatever they want. So make sure if you do have to leave your computer, you always do Windows L. That is access control. Another type of way to uh, make sure that you are as secure as possible is called device hardening. And there are four main features on device hardening that are very important. The first one is making sure that you disable unused wireless. When not in use, you should disable your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and NFC to ensure that nobody can gain access to your device. If you leave any of these wireless features on and you're not using them, then people could possibly hack into your computer wirelessly. So if you're not using Bluetooth, please turn it off. This not only goes for computers and desktops and laptops, but it also goes for your phone and tablets. So, uh, so disable unused wireless features is the first category of device hardening. The next one is configure a lockout. You should be able to configure a lockout time so that the lock screen appears after a certain period of idleness and usually a password or a pin must be entered to regain access. Now you can do Windows L like I mentioned and that'll go straight to your lock screen. However, you can also set it up as you can see in this screensaver over here you can set up a screensaver to come onto your screen, and then as it says here, it's clicked on resume display login screen. This will go to the lock screen, so that way you have to uh, open it up by using a, a password or a PIN. So configuring a lockout is another category of device hardening. The third category is enable security features. You should turn on Windows Defender, Windows Firewall, or whatever your system offers to enhance security. Your OS typically comes with some things by default, but you can also add in some additional software if you have other um, security features. But you should turn those on and make sure that those are active while you're using your computer. The last way to harden your device is to use encryption. You should always encrypt files and folders on your PE, especially, excuse me, on your PC, especially if it's sensitive data. You can encrypt an entire hard drive using BitLocker with Windows, which makes the hard drive unreadable if removed from the PC. So the four types of hardening your device are disabling your unused Wi-Fi or wireless features, configure a lockout time, 
enable security features, and also encrypt files. Those four things are important to know about device hardening. Now, we talked about going to a lock screen and having to go through that lock screen using a password. So let's talk about the different types of users and passwords that people can have on their computer. The user accounts can vary in access, and there's really three main types of user accounts that you can set up. You do have the administrator account. The administrator account has full permissions to do anything on the PC, and that really should be used only when making system changes. Uh, but you can literally do anything and you have access to everything. And that allows you, as an administrator, you can download new programs, you can make system changes, and you can do a lot of, um, a lot of administrator duties. Your standard account can only make changes affecting that current account. It doesn't affect the entire computer, just the account that you're logged into. This account should be used for everyday use on your computer. So whenever you're doing regular browsing of the internet or working or doing productivity software, or you're trying to use your computer just on the daily use, you should always be logged into your standard account, not your administrator account. If you go into your standard account and need to make system changes, remember that's where something will pop up where you can add in the administrator username and the administrator password. We're gonna talk about what, that, uh, what that's called later on during this video. And then finally, you have a guest account. This, this account only allows you to run a few applications and cannot change any system settings. This is always best for visitors that will briefly need your network. However, you can have the option of keeping your guest account turned on and your guest account turned off. If you turn on your guest account and are not currently using it or having anybody around that uses it, anybody can restart your computer and then get into your guest account because your guest account does not require any kind of username or password. So you would always wanna make sure the guest account is turned off unless it's needed by someone who's you know, briefly using your computer. Now, when you're making system changes, there will be some authentication that needs to happen. Authentication is verifying a user's identity to permit or block certain actions on a system. This allows you to be able to prove who you are and that you're allowed to do what you're trying to do. There's two types of authentication that the ITF Plus objectives cover, the single factor authentication and multi-factor authentication. The single factor authentication is relies on things that typically you know. That's what we call the knowledge factor. Typically that we're talking about username, and passwords, such as when you log into an email, all you need to do is a single factor, factor authentication, which means put in your username and your password, and then you're in. However, if it's something a little bit more, um, a little bit more serious, that you've got some major things happening, and you have to be really foolproof about the person who's doing it, that they are who they say they are, that's something called multi-factor authentication, where there's multiple ways to verify your identity. Typically, it's going to be two or more of the following. You have a knowledge factor, you have a possession factor, and an inheritance factor. Let's talk about what each one of those are. The knowledge factor is represents something we already talked about. It is something you know, typically your username and your password. The possession factor is something that you have with you, such as a key or a fob or some sort of card. When you go to an ATM machine, you don't just have to do a single factor authentication. You don't just have to put in your username or your password, or in this case, a PIN, but you also have to provide something that you, uh, that you have with you, such as a bank card or a credit card but that credit card is not enough by itself. Once you put the credit card in or the bank card in, then it wants you to prove that you know what the PIN number is. So it, it requires two or more things to be able to go in and deal with the banking and the financial transactions. The third one is called the inheritance factor. This is something that you are, and that would be like fingerprints or retinal scan or facial recognition. And whenever you think about those sci-fi uh, you know, high-tech laboratory movies, and they have someone going into a very critical 
a room where there's a lot of sensitive information, they typically have to prove who they are. And they sometimes have to scan a card that's on them. They sometimes have to put in a code in the door. And sometimes they even put like their hand on a, on a sensor or a fingerprint or a facial recognition or an eye retinal scan. So that uses all three of these, something that you know, something that you have, and something that you are. Some other ones that go along with this but aren't as popular uh, is something that you do, which is you can put in a pattern on a tablet or on a phone and some, somewhere where you are. If you've got GPS capabilities, they can say, hey, this particular person is trying to access this door. Let's use GPS technology to make sure that person is right outside our door instead of across town. So, the, But the main ones that you need to know are the knowledge factor, the possession factor, and the inherence factor. And remember, single factor authentication is typically the knowledge factor, whereas multi factor authentication is something that you have, know, something that you have, and something that you are. For password best practices, best practices is something about what everybody honestly should be doing, whether they're high tech people or low tech people. Most people have some sort of account and they have to create a password. A strong password should have the following characteristics when we talk about the complexity of the password. A traditional strong password should have eight or more characters. It should have an upper and a lowercase letter, at least one of each, and it should include numbers and it should include symbols. So just putting in grandma loves me or putting in apple one, two, three is not gonna be the best. You wanna make sure you're using uppercase, lowercase, numbers, letters, and symbols. And your uppercase doesn't have to be the first letter of the word like an English language would dictate. It can be anywhere in that. So you just have to make sure that you remember whatever this is. The next type of password best practices and policies is confidentiality. You wanna make sure you keep your password safe from other people. If you share your password, go ahead and expect others to access your stuff. It's not smart to do. It's like when, when people were in high school or people were in junior high and they share their locker combination and then all of a sudden you were upset or people were upset that things were stolen out of your locker. Well, I'm sorry, but you kind of set yourself up to do that. So you gotta make sure you keep this as confidential as you possibly can. Don't write down any passwords and if you do, keep it safe and hidden and protected. You should not also use the same password for multiple services or websites. You should have a different password for each one. So if you use the same one for every one, once someone knows that password, they have access to every single different thing that you have, that you have an account in. And also, if you're given a default password by an online service, the first thing you should do is immediately change it. And that goes into password expiration and reuse. Policies for passwords usually expire each month or every three months. And really you shouldn't reuse a password for six to 12 months after you first used it or really ever. Uh, so certain services might force users to change their passwords at certain intervals and passwords cannot be reused passwords used in the past. And some companies are really big about that. You can't use a previously used password. So you gotta use a different one. Single sign-on, remember we talked about this uh, where, where in the domain factor, if you have a domain compared to a work, a work group or a home group, a domain is where you can have a, have a single sign on. You can go in and you can sign into any computer and be able to get in with your pass with your username and your password. Single sign on also is true for password best practices because a lot of times whenever you're creating a new account, it might say confirm your identity through a Google account or through a Facebook account or through a LinkedIn account. And then you can just do that, log into your Facebook, and boom, you just created an account. Again, that's great, but you're using the same password for all these different accounts. So you gotta be real careful with single sign-on. It's very, um, it's not as safe as what it should be. Now, user account control is kind of what I mentioned earlier in this video. User account control uh, it prevents malware or rogue websites for making system changes without your knowledge and consent. There are bots out there all, the all over the place who are trying to add things to your computer. And without the user account control, or as we abbreviated UAC, then it would automatically be added to your computer and you didn't have knowledge of it and you didn't give it permission. So whenever system changes attempt to happen, you're gonna get this are, your, are you sure box that pops up. 
And if you are, if it's a major system change, it, standard users will have to provide admin credentials to continue. So you have to make sure that you enter those credentials and then click yes. If you don't have the rights or if someone who, has, who is a standard user is trying to do something to the com computer and doesn't have the rights to do it, they'll be stuck. And so this is kind of the safeguard, uh, the way that a computer protects itself from making system changes without your permission. Now, Mac and Linux do require root authentic authentication, which is the administrator, to accomplish the same thing. And here's a couple more pictures of user access control. Whenever you're trying, you're trying to allow this app to make changes to your device, do you want to do that? Again, if you're the administrator, then you would put in your PIN and hit yes. If you don't have a PIN in there, you'd have to click no. And you can always change the user account control settings. Uh, you can change it to always notify or never notify. It just depends on how many people are using your computer. So that's it with local security threats. The next uh, section deals with online security threats. These are things that can happen as you're surfing the internet or connected to the internet. So uh, as I mentioned before, we're going back to these malicious software. Malicious again stands for, um, or malicious software abbreviated would be malware, mal for malicious and ware for software. These are computer programs designed to designed to break into computers or cause havoc on computers. Uh, malware attacks from the internet, they can cause damage, they can take control of your computer, they can hijack these accounts, and they can also hold your data for ransom. Now there's um, eight different malware uh, types that the CompTIA ITF Plus objectives care about. And so we're gonna go into each of these in de detail. These are adware, spyware, spam, social engineering, viruses, Trojan horses, worms, and ransomware. So it's important to make sure that we can distinguish each one of these and have an idea of what each one of these represents. So let's start with adware. Now adware is software that displays unsolicited advertisements on your computer. Typically these come into the, with the form of pop-ups, not always. One symptom of adware is a home page redirection. Have you ever used your computer and wanted to go back to your home page, whether that was the Google search engine or whatever it was, and it always took you to a brand new page? No matter when you hit the home button, you always went to a brand new page. That is a symptom that you have adware on your computer. Uh, home page redirections changes your set home page, and some are temporary while others are locked in. Another symptom of, mal of adware is search engine redirection. You prefer to use Google or you prefer to use Bing, but they're always sending you to this other website to do a search and you don't want to use that other website. You had set your search uh, engine default page to be a certain one, but it keeps sending you to another one. That is, that is a way for them to profit their own business by making you use their search engine. So again, if you're going somewhere that you're not intending to, that is a symptom of having adware on your computer. As I mentioned, the most common one is a constant pop-up. They are bringing uninvited browser windows that pops up when visiting certain websites. If this happens, do not click on the pop-ups ever, ever, ever. That's exactly what they want you to do because the entire screen, even possibly the upper right-hand corner X, is a link to go to their website and it could be a bad website that downloads illegal software or um, unintended software onto your computer, which could bring more malicious software. So you'd never, ever, ever want to click on these pop-ups. So how do we get rid of them? There's a couple ways to do that. If you hit Alt-Tab, it will bring it to the front, and then once it's in the focus or in the very front of all the windows, you then hit Alt-F4. You're not clicking on it, you're hitting Alt-F4, and that will allow it to close. So you gotta be very, very careful when you're dealing with pop-ups. All of these are symptoms of adware. We are gonna go get into later on, we'll talk about how to get rid of some of this malware, because if you do have these symptoms, well, great. Well, now what do you do? Hold tight, we'll talk about the next step that you would do after that. So that's adware. That's the first malicious software that we're going to talk about. The next one is spyware. Now, spyware is defined uh, as software that monitors your computer usage habits 
and reports the information to the program's owner. There's actually usually nothing, um, nothing detrimental to your computer if you have spyware on it. It doesn't cause any problems or issues, and sometimes you might not even know that it's there. However, you are sending sensitive information to this other person who could use that against you. There's a couple of different ways that spyware can enter into your computer. You can have bundled entry and you can have disguised entry. Now bundled entry typically comes with bundled software that you wanted. Uh, it could be browser enhancements, performance boosters, search utilities, file savers, media players. It's something that you legitimately downloaded onto your computer, but it was all bundled in to that, um, to that software. And then unbeknownst to you, you now have spyware on your computer. Another one is called disguised entry. Disguised entry uses fear tactics and deception to trick users into installing the software. Sometimes these companies are so good because they end up making a pop-up look like a Windows uh, error message. And then it says, you have, spy or you have malware on your computer. Click here to, clean your, to scan your computer and d delete the malware. So it's scaring you into thinking that you already have something on there, and if you just click this window, it's going to clean your computer and the malware will go away. And that is not true. It's, it, they look like legitimate seeming window pop-ups, but they're not, and you would never want to click on it because, again, it's not a legitimate Windows error prompt. Those are called disguise entries. These can cause browser floods, which means a whole bunch of browsers end up opening up not what you intended to do. And they can also have key logging software, which means they're, they're, te they're keeping track of the keys that you type in, a, in order in hopes of finding some sort of password that you put in. To prevent spyware, you really don't want to install programs without knowing exactly what you're getting. Usually whenever you do some sort of download, it, you can go into advanced features and see exactly what's part of that. And you can uncheck the things that you don't want and check the things that you do want. You also want to use anti-malware software to re remove the spyware. The next type of malware is considered spam. Spam is unsolicited email that is received from an unknown source that the user did not ask for. Now these can come from legitimate businesses, real businesses that are contacting you to sell their product. And that's great, but you did not ask to be contacted by this legitimate business. So if it is an unsolicited email in any shape or form, it is considered spam. You also can have scams, which are fake businesses who offer you their, quote, product, but really only want your money. Once you send them the money, you never hear from them again. You don't get the product that they promised, and that's all that they wanted. They just wanted you to take the bait, give them money, and then leave. You see some of these with, as it says here, Nigerian princesses, princes, Nigerian princes offering money, saying that you know my grandfather died and left me this huge estate, and for tax purposes I can't do that. So you're lucky enough to get some of my money. Don't fall for that. Okay, those are scam, uh, scam emails. They can also be disguised emails, which are emails that come from a friend, someone that you truly know, but someone had hijacked their account just to say, hey, I trust this person, so I'm gonna click on anything that they send me. You gotta be careful. If it looks out of the ordinary for that particular person, feel free to contact them and say, did you send me this or whatever before you start clicking away on things. Now, to uh, most of our spam filters in an email program, we'll pick up most of these and put them in the junk folder. Uh, so that way they already know that's it is, but they're getting smarter and smarter, and so it's harder to be able to, to filter out all of them. So, and you also want to make sure you beware of the unsubscribe link. It might give you this crazy email and then down on the bottom it says, click here to uns unsubscribe. Well, they actually have usually a couple different unsubscribe links. And if you click on the wrong one, then you're going to do exactly what they wanted you to do. And you're going to their website or possibly downloading uh, some more malware on your computer. So to prevent spam, one thing is you should never post your email address publicly. Now, there's a lot of forms and fields that we have to fill out with our email, and that's fine when you're sending it to the business. But if you're just throwing your email down on Facebook or on a, on a public forum 
or a, or a chat room or things like that, then you're going to expect to see things that come your way that you're not wanting. So don't ever do that. And also email does filter and uh, filter or filter has filtering software that will prevent the majority of the spam. But it, again, it's not foolproof. Before I move on, uh, when you get a chance, feel free to go to YouTube and Google James Veach spam. There's some amazing TED Talk videos that he's done with spam. He went ahead and made uh, made it a point to answer some of these spams, not because he was falling for them, just to kind of waste their time. It's very comical and very entertaining. So feel free to, uh, to look up and go to YouTube and put in uh, James Veach spam and you'll see a couple videos they're very uh, very good the next one is social engineering now social engineering is the process of using or manipulating people to gain access to that network from the outside social engineering is humans using other humans there's a number of techniques aimed at using people to access systems and information it literally might have nothing to do with computers they're just trying to do whatever they can to get to you, to you or to get into your office or into your business, and then they can snoop around and possibly find some things that they could use against you. They could be what they call, quote, follow-up calls when there wasn't a first call in the, in, the, uh, in the first case. And some other types of social engineering that could possibly happen are infiltration, telephone scams, email phishing, and security messages. And we're gonna go through each of these a little bit more in detail. Now with infiltration, infiltration is where attackers enter the building or your home under the guise of someone who should actually be there. Like you called for a repairman and all of a sudden a repairman shows up, but it's not a repairman. It's someone who's posing like a repairman, just trying to get into your uh, house or get into your business to be able to snoop around and maybe see, find some confidential information. Uh, it could be a cleaning personnel or a messenger or you know any kind of person that really should be there. And one way that they can get into your building is what we call tailgating. Tailgating is when someone has a code or a card that they have to scan to get into that part of the building, and the person just follows right behind them and open and goes through the door as they go through the door without having to scan or verify who they are. So you want to be very careful when it comes to uh, tailgating. If you are going through a coded doorway with a pin or with a card, please make sure you close that door before the next person comes and, and stop anybody who's trying to follow you. These people, again, can search for compromising information such as passwords, and they can talk to legitimate people to gain information as well, but they shouldn't be there in the first place. That is infiltration as well as tailgating. Telephone scams are where an attacker uses a phone call to get the desired information. They're going to call to get passwords, they're going to call to verify credit card information, they're going to call to verify email, and a lot of times that's what they say. They're just like, there, you have a problem with your credit card account. Please verify your credit card number and your three-digit code on the back. Well, that's just a way for them to get that information. It's not real. No real bank or anybody who wants to verify these will do this over the phone, so don't trust anybody that does. Email phishing. Now, I want to make sure that we know the difference between social engineering and phishing. They're a little bit different. Email phishing is the act of trying to get people to give their security information by pretending to be someone else electronically. So phishing is honestly just a way for them to send out an email to a whole bunch of people and whoever takes the bait, they don't care who it is, then they get that money, they get that information, they get what they were searching for. Social engineering is typically directed to a specific person, the CEO of a company, the bank manager, uh, the lead, um, the, the principal in a high school, something like that. It's, it's geared to a, a specific person who has that information or has the money or has whatever the person's looking for. Fishing is just kind of a throw it out there. I'm, I'm going to go fishing and whoever takes the bait, whoever bites my, uh, bites my uh, line, I don't care who it is, I'm going to get it. So there's a difference between those two. But it's the act of trying to get people to give their security information by pretending to be someone else electronically. The message is pretending to be from a trusted source. They might be scare tactic with a link to fix the problem. You can always check for a return address that don't quite match a trusted source, and or you can just immediately move it to junk mail if you don't recognize it. Typically, these phishing emails contain a hyperlink 
that appears to be a legit destination, but is not. You might say, I am the CEO of Chase Bank. Please click here to go to our website. And it looks like it's chase.com, but it's actually like Chase uh, fakechase.com. It looks very similar to what it should be, but it, there's a little bit different. Uh, some indicators are that no recipient or institution is named, and usually these things have grammatical or spelling errors. It doesn't mean these people are stupid. It just means that they know if there is a spelling error and someone falls for it, then that person is stupid, and they've got them exactly where they want them to, and they can get money from them and milk them for all that they're worth. You can also have some security message that are both fake and real that pop up. These are pop-ups that alert you to a system problem. However, clicking on this pop-up will install real malware on your system or prompt you to buy their product, which will, quote, fix a problem that you don't have. The next type of malware is viruses. Viruses are malicious software that gets passed from computer to computer. This usually attaches to a program and runs when that program is being used. This a virus can wipe out email, erase hard drives, steal information, send spam email, etc. So it's very you got to be very careful when something happens out of the ordinary that you didn't intend. If any of those things happen, odds are your computer has a virus. Um, other types of malware is a Trojan horse. A Trojan horse is a freestanding program that do something other than what the person who runs the program thinks that it will. If you know the history of Troy uh, and the Trojan horse, uh, these two armies were at war with each other and one sent them a, quote, um, peace offering and they send this huge Trojan horse and they finally opened the gates and brought the peace offering in and they were like, this is great because we... You know, we, 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 we love this and it's beautiful and we're going to present it and show it off in the middle of our city. And then at nighttime, all of these people, the other army were inside of the Trojan horse and they got out and they murdered everyone in their sleep. So it looks like a legitimate thing. It's a freestanding program that does something that you want it to do, but it also does this other thing. There's something hidden inside of it that... Uh, ends up ruining your computer or ends up doing something that you didn't intend. A worm is a complete program that travels from machine to machine, usually through networks. It can copy itself, overload networks, and even stop the internet. So the difference between a virus and a worm is the virus typically messes with your individual computer, whereas a worm will kind of sneak its way through the network and infect every computer that's connected to it. And the last one here is ransomware. Ransomware is exactly what it sounds like. It's malware that locks your computer and holds it for ransom. They will typically display a threatening warning that if you don't pay or you don't meet their demands, your files will be deleted. And that really scares a lot of people because there's a lot of important files on their computer that they don't ever want to lose. So uh, they do this through a couple different ways. One is called Scareware. Scareware is anti-malware software that just gums up your system. Uh, this scares the user into buying bogus software to, quote, fix a problem that you don't have. Uh, there's really no harm to your PC other than just these annoying pop-ups that, that show up. Another one is called a lock screen. This is a full-size window that appears warning you that you have violated the law in some way and have to pay a fine. The PC won't work while this ransomware is active. So again, as you can see on this um, graphic over here on the right-hand side, it says your computer has been locked. The operating system is locked due to violation of the federal laws of the United States of America, blah, 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 blah. It looks legit. You know, it even has this nice little seal of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Department of Justice. And it says you have 72 hours to pay the fine, otherwise you will be arrested. So this is just a way to uh, lock you out of your um, lock you out of your system, lock you out of your files, and you think, well, I want to get my files, and I don't want to be arrested, so I'm going to do this. Uh, again, it's just an easy way for them to get money, but it's not real. If if the FBI is going to do something about you know uh, arresting you, they're not going to do it through some sort of pop up window that comes on your account. They're going to do it through, um, you know, probably knock on your door and arrest you from, like that. So don't trust any of these pop-ups that come up. 
but you do want to obviously, uh, you know, try to get your files back. So there's some ways that we can protect against that. The other one is encrypting. Uh, encrypting honestly is the worst. It'll encrypt and lock your personal files, even sometimes if the ransomware is removed and you do what they ask you to do, the files are still locked without a decryption key. Uh, so, um, so you gotta be really careful on that you don't, you, you know, you might have lost your files regardless, so why go ahead and pay them? Because you're not gonna get it back. So how do we protect against these eight different malwares that we've talked about? Again, I wanna, re I wanna remind you, I would highly recommend you go back and rewatch those um, slides regarding those eight types of malware so you can know what each one of them are and know what makes one stand out compared to the next. One way that we can protect ourselves against malware is just to make sure that we have the latest and greatest updates to our computer. When, if you have a Windows computer, you would use Windows Update. This is a simple automatic method to ensure that your security is up to date. When you do Windows Update, not only is it gonna give you the best software and the best hardware updates to your computer, but it's also gonna download the best security updates, which means it's looking for new malware things that are out there and protecting your system from that. So if you don't have Windows Update automatically turned on with a scheduled update every couple days or every week, I would highly recommend that you do that. Um, it keeps your system fully patched. And when we say patch, we talk about an addition to the OS in order to patch some sort of hole in the code. So it's going to make sure that you've got a, a good security catch, patch and patch management is the act of keeping your patches up to date. So again, running Windows Update regularly. Uh, this, this is designed to run only really when the user is not active and you can change all settings so it runs when convenient or not at all. I do highly recommend that you do an automatic update. Other ways that you can protect against malware is using an anti-malware program. Uh, and uh, this will protect the PC in two different ways. You can do a seek and destroy mode or you can do a passive sentry mode. Now these anti-malware programs, if you have a Windows computer, it automatically comes with Windows Defender. And honestly, it's really good. It's a great one to have um, being used every now and then. If you want something more than that, you're welcome to purchase uh, Norton Antivirus or McAfee or anything else. But Windows Defender is pretty sufficient. Uh, but what it, Windows Defender would do is it would have a seek and destroy mode, which kind of acts as a sword. It will scan incoming messages for any kind of suspicious code. And if it finds something, it's going to stop it from being implemented in your computer and harming your computer. You also have a passive sentry mode. Uh, this monitors the PC's activity, checking for viruses when certain events occur, such as programs being downloaded. It acts as a shield for your computer. You always want to make sure you use a list of known malware code types or signatures to track any new malware and stop it. And again, as long as your Windows Defender is up to date, it will do that for you. So here are some more malware prevention tips. You should always obtain and update an anti-malware program that scans your computer regularly. Before, beginning, uh, before downloading any software, make sure you know where it's coming from, and that is a trusted source. If you just have, you know, joesbirds.com and they want you to download this file so you can have the most updated list of birds, you might not know what that is. Uh, you might not know that um, particular source as well as you know some other places. So make sure you know the source. And also be always be careful with opening email links and attachments. Make sure that they are trusted and they're coming from someone that you do trust. Uh, because if it's just some random spam email message and they send you a link or an attachment, you know, don't click on that because you don't know it and you don't know what could be inside. For the IT Fundamentals Plus exam, U61 version, there are five malware recovery tips. All five of these are very important for you to know and the order of these are important for you to know. Uh, we always wanna follow these steps whenever you think you might have malware on your computer. So the first one is that you should recognize. You should understand what the effects of malware do and be able to recognize them when you see them. Uh, the computer suddenly slowing down. Your network's very slow. You got pop-ups coming up. You've got things that are happening that don't normally happen. So recognize these and don't just think that your computer's, you know, done and you need to get a new one. You can fix it, but you need to recognize these symptoms and understand, hey, this is happening. I might have some malware on my computer. 
Once the anything happens and you recognize that, you should then quarantine your computer, which means you disconnect the computer from the network immediately. Remember, there is some malware that travel through the network and can affect other people that are also connected. So if you think that you have malware, you want to disconnect the ethernet cord or, dis or turn off your Wi-Fi network or any other wireless settings, so that way you don't accidentally infect other people who are working nearby. So quarantining is taking it off the network and making it be a standalone device, turning off the internet. The next one is search and destroy. You wanna use anti-malware programs to remove malware. Go ahead and run an active scan. And if it, once it does that of everything, do a full scan. There's different ways that you can scan a computer. You can do a quick scan, you can do a full scan, you can do a partition scan of certain drives. You wanna run a full scan, everything, and if it, if it finds any malware, immediately delete it. Then you can remediate, which is fixing the affected files by using backups. If that, something has caused damage and it's irreparable and you can't fix it, there is these things that you can go back to a time when things were better. It's called backup and restore for Windows or time machine for Mac. All of those will allow you to remediate the program and go back a few days before things were bad, and then it will install the, the better versions of the things that were, that were damaged. And then finally, the last one is to educate yourself. Inform yourself and others about best practices to prevent being infected. Teach users not to click on stuff. Don't go to sketchy websites. Just do smart things from here on out and help others to do smart things from here on out. So that way you don't have to follow these steps again. So make sure you know all five of those steps, recognize, quarantine, search and destroy, remediate, and educate. Now some networking threats, this is specifically on a network, that you could possibly happen are the following. You have eavesdropping, where attackers can use packet sniffing tools to capture network traffic in order to view internet activity. It's very easy to monitor network traffic with free tools, so you gotta watch out for people possibly eavesdropping within your network. Man in the middle attacks, sometimes abbreviated as MITM. This is where an attacker impersonates a machine and can intercept network activity for malicious reasons. You're trying to send a request to your internet service provider, but someone's in between there acting like the internet service provider and intercepting the data that you send. So the third party is what should have been a secure conversation is going ahead and taking that information and doing, using it for malicious reasons. And also denial of service attacks, abbreviated as DOS. This is where attackers intentionally prevent the legitimate use of an IT service. Uh, attackers designed to bring the network resources down. You can combat with botnet or zombie computers that make more efficient distributed denial of service attacks um, harder. Always, 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 whenever you're surfing the internet, you wanna make sure you're using smart web use because again, if you don't, malware could possibly get into your system and things could be bad. Uh, so make sure you understand the risk of public workstations. There are always these public computers at libraries, at hotels, at kiosks, at different places where you know you can log in and do whatever you want to because it's, you know, it's a luxury. It's, this is a public computer, I can use my own computer and that's great. However, you honestly should be avoiding these. But if you have to use them, the very minimum, if you have to use them, don't do anything confidential. Don't make any kind of financial transactions. Don't log into a bank account. Don't, do, don't send passwords through an email. Don't do anything that could compromise. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't do anything that could compromise what you're trying to do um, you know, recently because they can be intercepted. Public workstations can have key logging, can have malware. They can track where you're going, where you've been, what you've typed in. So you always wanna be careful on what you're doing on public workstations. If you have to use it, again, refrain from doing any kind of confidential information and you should use a what we call a high privacy mode. This is where it's a way for you to be able to kind of hide everything that you're doing uh, and it won't be reported or it won't be tracked if the case, if there happens to be any malware on the system. If you're using Microsoft Edge, you can do Control Shift P, that will put you in an in private mode, that's what this picture over here shows you. Or if you're using Chrome, you do Control Shift N, which is incognito mode. Again, this is a way that prevents Internet Explorer from storing data about your browsing session. 
Also make sure you understand how to recognize secure websites. Now a secure site uses encryption protocols to create secure communication between the user and the server. Easy, easy indicators, as we mentioned before, previous to this chapter, is that it has HTTPS in the URL, as you can see it's pointed to down below. And also look for the little lock in the corner. And sometimes it's after the website, sometimes it's before the website. It just depends on what your browser is that you're, uh, that you're using. Other ways to, for smart web use is you should recognize invalid certificates. Every website has to have a certificate to prove that it's a trusted connection. And those certificates expire, expire every year, every two years, whatever the case is. And so if there is an invalid certificate, then it will usually alert you to this. Um, if it's a trusted site, go ahead and disregard. But if it's a new site, that the user honestly should stay away if there's some sort of certificate warning. And untrusted sources may be safe. Uh, it just depends. You want to make sure you check the URL carefully. When accessing a website, a page might load that says the connection is untrusted. That's what you see over here in this graphic. A site cannot be trusted uh, if their certifi certificate comes from a non-trusted authority, if it's a known phishing site that your browser has labeled do not trust, or if it loads software when visiting the site, which triggers this warning. Whenever you go to the site, if it automatically starts loading software onto your computer, that's not good either. So untrusted sources, um, you really should stay away from. Some of them may be safe, but you want to make sure you look at that URL to make sure you put it in right and that it's trusted. You should also recognize suspicious links. Uh, you can look at the URL in messages. So if they give you a link, if you hover over the link, a little box should pop up either, as you can see here, yahoo.com slash question slash scam slash crazy slash whatever, or also it'll show you down below, down here, where it's pointing to. If it's, uh, if it's in your email as well. But kind of hover over it and make sure that these two websites match because sometimes what it says here and where it's actually going is not gonna be the same. So this one's probably safe because it's www.yahoo.com slash. So what you wanna do is you wanna find the first backslash and look before it, yahoo.com. Here, if I look at my first backslash and look before it, it says www.yahoo.com.question. This is not the same. Dot .question is an, is an extension of the website, which is not a legitimate website. Yahoo.com, that's a legitimate website. Yahoo.com.question is not a legitimate website. So always make sure you're looking at the first backslash and read backwards to see if the, if the domain is legitimate. Also beware of URLs that uh, that use IP addresses. If it, instead of saying yahoo.com, it might say 192.168.4.1. And I wouldn't trust that because you don't know where that's going to take you. There are also some suspicious banner ads that might pop up at certain websites. Uh, banner ads are advertisements that appear along the top or the side of a web page. Sometimes they're legit, like this Best Buy website. Uh, this is uh, techradar.com, uh, and Tech Radar has a Best Buy advertisement up here at the top, some advertisements down here on the bottom. And again, that's okay, because that's actually how this website makes money. That's not the problem. However, if, uh, if, it's, if it's a sketchy one, if it kind of looks weird, too good to be true ads or poor quality ads, you know, I would stay away from that and, and don't ever click on those ads or those banners. The other thing that you should be careful for is limiting the use of PII, which is personally identifiable information. Uh, you should use a separate email account for filling in online forms and purchases. Personally identifiable information are things that are, are true to you. Your telephone number, your address, where you work, what school you went to, what your parents' names are, what your mother's maiden name is. Things that you could possibly use for any kind of password that's a PII. Um, you should really sometimes use a fake email address whenever you're filling out forms uh, or a separate email account. Uh, when filling out an online form, you can also use a fake phone number. However, unless you're making, making a purchase, if you're making a purchase for e-commerce, then you wanna use your real phone number, but you don't have to put your 
legitimate phone number on there, so that's okay. You can also even put a fake birthday. Uh, if you are younger, if you say that you're younger than 13, it's actually Ill illegal for marketers to solicit to children. However, again, if this is like a government website or some sort of purchase website where you have to prove that you're older than a certain thing, then don't do that. But if it's just some regular form that you're filling out, you don't have to necessarily tell the truth regarding your email, your phone number, and your birthday, uh, unless it's a legitimate thing that's going to be used, um, you know, for uh, an authorized um, purchase or an authorized reason. You can also look yourself up on sites that offer personal information about people. At your request, sometimes they will remove this information. So Google yourself, see what comes up, and if there's some things on there that, you know, emails or phone numbers or birthdays or mother's band name, you can ask that, that you can contact that company and ask them to remove it. Something for browser security to make sure your browsers are secure is that uh, you do want to make sure you update any browsers and plugins that, um, that you're currently using. Uh, this typically happens automatically now, it's not always, uh, but Windows Update usually takes care of this. You can also adjust your security settings, which will limit access to some sites. It just depends on whether your internet and whether what kind of security level that you want to do. For Internet Explorer, you would go to Internet Options and go through that. For Google, you just go to Settings and you'd be able to have some internet security options as well. Uh, as always, to uh, for browser security, really you should clear your cookies. Now what that means is a cookie is a small text file that contains information about you and your activities. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, what it will do is it will track certain things according to your account. It will store previous visit information, which actually loads the site a little bit faster instead of having to start all the way over. They will identify you as a user. They'll track your shopping, co shopping cart items. They will present a different content sometimes to you if you're always looking at you know, diapers for, for a baby, then they're always going to show you diapers first on that website. Uh, again, it could be really nice, but you should really clear your cookies regularly so that way you have good, secure browser history. Malicious cookies can track information that you don't want to be tracked. So there's a way that you can go to, the again, the Privacy tab for Internet Explorer or Settings, and you can then clear the cookies. Uh, browsers will record your browsing data, uh, and if malware is present, they, they could possibly record that and then send it to the attacker. That's the spyware that we talked about. So you can clear your cookies and clear your uh, history and temporary internet files. And this is what Internet Explorer would look like. You can uh, preserve your favorite website data, which is okay. Keep cookies and temporary internet files that enable your favorite websites to retain. As long as you've got you know just a few favorite ones, it's probably fine, but you should delete your temporary internet files, the cookies, and even history every now and then if you have a list of websites that you want to get rid of. So you just hit that and then click delete. The other thing that's good for browser security is that you should disable unneeded plugins, toolbars, and extensions. Plugins, toolbars, and extensions are things that are, again, really nice that help your ex browsing experience to be better, but sometimes that also puts in some sort of malware on your computer. If you go into Chrome and do slash slash extensions, you're going to see all the different extensions that you have. And some of these are possibly important. You know, Acro Adobe Acrobat is probably one you want to keep. But this Adblock Plus and Adblock, you, if you don't remember installing these, then you can uh, delete them. You can delete both of those just by uh, enabling them or hitting the trash can button. Plugins, just to make sure we're clear, plugins are, um, are kind of previous ways that browsers used to use security or at least to help you um, have a better browsing experience and those are not really used anymore uh, so you should really be uninstalling all plugins toolbars are the same way they're outdated and dangerous sometimes like on a browser they might put in a yahoo search engine toolbar at the very top and they put so many toolbars in it makes the space of your browser small and it takes up all that room so if you do find one you should uninstall it extensions are the best way to go now uh, these are less intrusive and more secure. However, but if an extension is not needed or was put on there inadvertently, uninstall it. 
autofill is a way for people to be able to plug in or to type in words and it automatically fills it, things that you are always going to speed up to use on websites, which is really nice. This is great if you have a personal machine. It's not great if you share your computer with somebody else. So you can go into an autofill or autocomplete um, section and uncheck that. So that way it's not automatically there. The reason this is bad is because if you put in your username and password onto a bank website and the autofill is there or the autocomplete is there, the next time someone goes on to that website, not necessarily you, you're, they're going to see your username and your password. They just have to hit submit or enter and boom, they're into your financial records. So you should turn that off or not save the autofill settings for those confidential um, places on your computer. All right, and then finally, the last thing we talked about, I know we've had a lot today, is firewalls. Firewalls are devices or software that protect computers from unauthorized access to and from the internet. Now, Windows comes with its own firewall system called Windows Defender Firewall. Again, make sure that's turned on and connected, but it will block certain incoming traffic that could do harm to your computer. Uh, it could do harm to your hardware devices, software components, and the Windows Firewall is going to be helpful to protect yourself from all that. So you have a you have Windows Defender, which stops malware uh, from getting in or or detecting the malware in your system. And a firewall is basically like a wall around your computer that stops um, any kind of un, um, un unneeded and unasked for content to come into your computer. All right, great. So that is it for chapter 11. Again, a lot of information because they put two chapters in one. We have local security threats, standalone device, and we have online security threats. What happens when you connect your computers and the different kinds of malware that you can intercept? Let's take a look at our um, review questions and see um, how we did. Feel free to go back and take a look at any of the sections that we talked about. There's a lot of different categories. Uh, and before we go through these questions, and as always, as we go through the questions, feel free to pause the video if you want a chance to be able to think about the answer uh, and then check to see how your answer compares with mine. Number one, what is a person doing when searching trash for useful information? A, dumpster diving, B, garbage mining, C, cracking, D, trash talking. The answer is A, dumpster diving, searching through your trash to find useful information. B, Edward loiters at the local cafe, taking notes on what people type on their computers, especially at the login screens. What kind of theft does he practice? A, cracking, B, dumpster diving, C, infiltration, D, shoulder surfing. In this case, it, we're assuming that he's at the cafe and he's looking over people's shoulders and looking to see what people type on their computers. So that would be an example of shoulder surfing. The answer for two is D. And this is what a lot of your ITF plus uh, U61 exams are going to look like. They're kind of going to make a story out of it. They're going to have a person's name. They're going to explain what the person's doing. And then they're going to ask a question about that situation. So this is very common on what you're going to see whenever you take your test. And then you'll have some options to choose from. Number three, disabling the Bluetooth adapter on a laptop when it is not in use is an example of A, dumpster diving, B, cracking, C, device hardening, D, hardware theft protection. If you are turning off your wireless communications when they're not being used, that's an example of D, device hardening. Uh, I'm sorry, C, device hardening. Number four, which of the following could prevent people from snooping on a device that you leave unattended for several minutes? A, configuring a lockout time. B, shoulder surfing. C, using a strong password. D, disabling Wi-Fi. If you have to leave a device, uh, honestly, you should be locking your screen right away. However, if you have a short lockout time, that's also okay too. Uh, if you put a five minute lockout time or a two minute lockout time, then that's gonna be the best if you can't just lock it right away. So it is A, configuring a lockout time. Number five, which type of Windows accounts would be appropriate for a visitor to your home? A, standard, B, guest, C, administrator, D, limited. If it's a visitor to your home, you would probably want to do B, guest. Number six, which type of Windows account does Microsoft recommend for daily use? A, standard, B, guest, C, administrator, D, limited. Daily use, standard. Administrator is only when you need to make system changes. Standard is for your everyday browsing and everyday use. 
Number seven, what is password confidentiality? A, selecting a password that uses a detail from your life you are confident no one else knows. B, a binding legal agreement that supports people won't share or disclose your password so that it is safe to tell it to them. C, keeping your password secret but not using default passwords, not writing it down, not using it in many places, and not sending it through insecure communications. Or D, none of the above. Confidentiality for passwords is everything that option C talks about. Keeping it secret, don't use the defaults, don't write it down, don't use it in multiple places, and don't send it through any kind of instant message, chat, uh, email communication. Number eight, which of these is the stronger password? A, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. B, Mike Myers. C, explication. D, M, exclamation point, K, E, M, three, Y, three, R, Z. The strongest one of this bunch is D because it uses uppercase, lowercase, numbers, letters, and symbols. And remember, you have to also have at least eight characters, and we are, we're good with that one. Number nine, which of these is not a factor in password management? A, confidentiality, B, expiration, C, guest, D, complexity. Password management is a way for you to make sure that using the right kinds of passwords and doing the right things with them, guess has nothing to do with that. The rest of them do. Number 10, what Windows feature prevents unauthorized system changes? A, UAC, B, DVI, C, NFC, D, WPS. Unauthorized system changes are protected with the user account control, which is UAC. 11, which of these types of programs is bothersome, but not necessarily dangerous? A, worm, B, adware, C, virus, D, trojan. The only one that is annoying, but not necessarily dangerous of these is adware. Those pop-ups, those homepage and search engine redirections are really annoying, really bothers me, but it's not gonna necessarily harm your computer. 12, which of the following are alternative methods of closing a pop-up window? Choose two. A, clicking inside the pop-up. B, pressing Alt F4. C, right-clicking the program's taskbar icon and selecting close. D, running your antivirus software. To close a pop-up window, which other than clicking the X on it, one option, because we're doing two here, is Alt F4. The other one is you can right click the program's taskbar icon and selecting close. If I go down here and I want to I want to close a certain program, I could do this. I could right click on it and then I can close the value that way. That way I don't have to click on this window the way it is. So it is B and C. And finally, 13. Oh, we got more than this. I'm sorry. 13. What is spam? Unwanted email messages a type of virus, an antivirus program, a type of firewall. Spam is unwanted email messages. 14, besides using anti-malware software, what two things can you do to protect your Windows machine from intruders? Choose two. A, install all available Windows updates. B, use only Internet Explorer. C, back up your data. D, use a firewall. To protect your Windows machine from intruders, you do want to make sure that you are completely up to date with everything that's there. Uh, your Windows Day update because also includes some security updates. And to protect it from intruders, you should use a firewall. Now, all these other things are okay. Back up your data. Use only an Explorer. I don't agree with that. I wouldn't stay away from that for my personal opinion. But it's BA and D. 15, after you have uh, recognized that there is a virus on your PC, what is the next step? We talked about that five-step process. Recognize was number one. What's the next step for removing the virus? A, to educate. B, to search and destroy. C, to quarantine. D, to remediate. Once you've recognized that you have malware on your machine, the next step is to quarantine your machine. Unplug it from the network. Turn off your wireless uh, connectivity. 
16. How can you defend against malware delivered by email? A. Delete old, old messages regularly. B. Don't open attachments from unknown senders. C. Only use the preview window. D. Only use Mozilla Thunderbird. You can defend against malware delivered by email by B. Not opening attachments from unknown senders. 17. What type of file tracks your activities on the internet? A. Spam. B. Java. C. Pop-up. D. Cookie. The thing that tracks your activities on the internet is our cookies. 18. Which of the following might you want to disable to protect your privacy? A. Autofill forms. B. Hyperlinks. C. Certificates. D. In private browsing. To protect your privacy, you would want to disable autofill forms. So that way someone can't see what you automatically put in for your bank account. 19. Which type of malware tries to get you to pay a fee to decrypt your files? A, Trojan, B, Worm, C, Spyware, D, Ransomware. To pay a fee means you're trying to pay a ransom to get your stuff back. So that is D, Ransomware. And finally, number 20. Now, the reason there's so many of these is because I put two chapters into one, so I put two 10-question uh, review questions into one that one uh, document. So that's why there's 20 instead of 10, like we normally do. 20, what indicates that you've browsed to a secure web page? Select two. The web address starts with HTTP colon backslash backslash. B, the web address starts with HTTPS colon backslash backslash. C, a small lock appears in the browser. D, a small key appears in the browser. It is secure as long as it is HTTPS and a small lock appears in the browser. So the answer is B and C. All right, that's it for chapter 11. Again, a big chapter with a lot of content. Feel free to review this as you're at your leisure, whatever you need. We'll be back with chapter 12 as we get closer and closer to the end of the textbook. Uh, thanks for joining me, and as always, keep on keeping on.